Uh, my name is Rich Leonard. I'm a judge with the Bankruptcy Court in North Carolina and here today in my capacity of an all-star team fed team. Uh, this is my fourth privacy conference and my ties here are both professional and personal that Dean Douglas, who welcomed you yesterday, actually started his legal career in our spare bedroom in Raleigh, uh, waiting on his first paycheck from my wife's law firm so he could rent an apartment. So we've come full circle. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Our public access program, or PACER, it is, is always known, has hit some remarkable benchmarks in the past year. Because we finally do have all federal courts, including the appellate courts, using the same case management system, it is now a universal database of cases in the federal courts. We have just signed up our one millionth account holder and are adding about 5,000 new account holders a week. And we're nearing the end of a massive assessment survey of all of our users that's giving us valuable information about where we need to go in the future. We have some new developments that we're proud of and we hope to talk about and display for you today. I think no one can really dispute that PACER is the most robust and comprehensive access program in any court system in the world currently. And those of us who have had a hand in it over the years are, pr are proud that we originated it entirely within the federal courts without any external requirements showing what remains our complete internal commitment to transparency and accessibility. But at the same time, our public access efforts are under attack in the media and the blogospheres as never before. We are charged both with not making our information sufficiently accessible through commercial search engines and somewhat paradoxically at the same time faulted for not protecting the privacy of the litigants whose interests are behind our firewalls. There are objections to the fee-based system that Congress has instructed us to implement and accusations that we've distorted the concept of public access to spend fees on extraneous projects. In my view, at times, the rhetoric has outrun the facts. We're here today to tell you where we are, to hear from you, and to engage on any issue on which you would like to engage us. Uh, this is how we're going to proceed. First, uh, Judge Haynes and Ms. Del Monte are going to bring us up to date on the continuing development and tweaking of privacy rules for litigant information in the federal courts. Second, Judge Smith and Ms. Sullivan are going to wade into the surprisingly tricky waters of opinions, uh, exactly and particularly at the trial court level. What are they? How do we classify and distribute them? And neat ways that they can be enhanced with new technologies. Next, Judge Haynes and Mr. Schedule are going to talk about and demonstrate a new product of which I'm particularly proud that we will soon offer through PACER where we actually allow you to access the raw digital recordings of court proceedings. Next, Mr. Schedule is going to show you the new search engine that PACER has developed that we're about to unveil in the next few weeks. Next, Mr. Shakian is going to walk you through the uh, comprehensive user assessment of, uh, that we have just completed that shows us pretty clearly what are perceived to be by our actual users, our strengths, and our deficiencies. And finally, uh, Mr. Shakian and I are going to talk briefly about the massive effort already underway in the federal courts under the acronym of Next Generation or Next Gen as we attempt proactively to build our case management system for the future and thus derivatively our public access system. And then we hope to hear from you. It's a lot to cover. We are confident we can do it uh, and uh, have time to uh, engage uh, as much as possible with each of you uh, at the conclusion. So without further ado, Judge Haynes, uh, Susan. Thank you, Rich. Um, my name's Jim Haynes. I'm a uh, bankruptcy judge in Portland, Maine. And uh, Susan Del Monte is a from the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts. She staffs the CACM Committee, which is the uh, Court Administration Case Management Committee of the Judicial Conference. Uh, we've worked together on public access and privacy issues for some years now, following the work that was done by Rich Leonard, who preceded me on CACM and really was there at the infancy of um, the transition to electronic public access uh, from the old uh, practical obscurity days uh, we talked about yesterday. Um, Can we have the PowerPoint display, please? Excuse me, Judge Haynes. Sure. 
and there we go. So uh, it's, a, and I think it is important, as, as Rich mentioned, that the, um, the existing public access mechanism is, uh, is available broadly, and we'll talk about the dimensions of that. Uh, many of you are aware of it, but it is derivative of uh, the case management system, the electronic case management system. Uh, some time ago, back in 1999, uh, really the federal courts were on the threshold, some of the bankruptcy courts across the threshold, uh, for electronic case management, managing their files electronically. And uh, some bright lights uh, ascertained that if we have a digitized court record system and case management system, it can be made available to the public and provide the kind of access at desktop computers that could otherwise uh, previously only been ha had uh, by going to the courthouse and looking through the files. But in, in anticipating uh, those developments, um, the story that I have is that uh, at one of the CACM meetings, they took a tour of a bankruptcy court uh, and thumbed through the, the bankruptcy files for a typical consumer bankruptcy and were really, um, those of us in the bankruptcy field see this stuff day in and day out, and so I wouldn't say our eyes glaze over them, but it's the sort of stuff that we expect to see in bankruptcy files. But uh, district court judges and appellate court judges took a look at it, and in conjunction with the bankruptcy court judges went, wow, do we really want all this stuff about you know, the children and you know, how many teddy bears there are in the bedrooms and uh, all those things, we really want all that just out with no filter uh, available on the internet. You know, there was a, and so starting in 1999 with uh, the CACM subcommittee started considering the implications of making all these filings available on the internet and developed a policy that was adopted by the judicial conference which is the governing policy setting body of the federal courts in 2001. That policy was initially uh, aimed at providing access to civil case files uh, over the internet. Uh, and it was uh, later, after further discussion and study, we decided that the Judicial Conference decided that access to criminal case files could be had over the internet as well. Um, there are different concerns in each, and we'll talk more specifically about some of the ongoing uh, issues that uh, result from uh, criminal case files in particular. But as of 2003, uh, subject to the judge's traditional ability to seal case, uh, cases uh, or pleadings, uh, civil case files and criminal case files were all available subject to this judicial conference policy. Um, the Social Security disability benefits cases, which typically have a lot of medical information, were not provided via the internet for public access. Uh, again, a nod to the privacy interests of the individuals whose cases were being litigated in the courts. Uh, the docket and the opinions uh, would be available, the orders, uh, but the party filings would not be out on the internet. Just as in days before, those would be available at the courthouse if somebody came into the courthouse and asked to see the file, they could see it there, but it wouldn't be immediately broadcast and available. Those inner, inner parts of the social security files wouldn't be available on the internet. Uh, in connection with the uh, making available of civil case files on the internet, uh, again, looking towards privacy concerns, uh, the policy required that personal identifiers be redacted. And again, because court files reflect what the parties put into them, the redaction uh, responsibility was placed on those who file. Uh, if you want something protected, then, then you take the responsibility to protect it at the threshold. After it's filed, the court file is what is filed in the court. But uh, social security numbers were limited to the last four digits, dates of birth only the year. Uh, financial account numbers, last four digits, names of minors, just initials. Um, and no home addresses, uh, only city and state in criminal trials. Um, and there were exceptions for voluminous case files that basically involved the transfer of the content of files created in another forum 
into the federal courts. So, uh, for example, a case that was removed, uh, we would not say that the redaction would have to <coughs> basically be post-fact and go back and, and, uh, and take place to what, what came in from another court. Now, the policy was designed to work in connection with PACER. So, um, PACER is the vehicle by which parties file cases, file pleadings, uh, and through which uh, the court distributes uh, opinions and orders, uh, scheduling matters and all the like. It's the, the workings of the cases uh, available on the internet, but that availability is not restricted to participants in the trials. Anyone can register through PACER, get a PACER account, and obtain access to the materials. And I guess the key, the key issue there, and some would take, uh, take issue with it and some, some wouldn't, is that in order to get the access, one has to go through the PACER portal and uh, register and be responsible for paying the cost of, uh, of the files. Um, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, it provides a tag so that one can ascertain who's been into the files uh, in the event that there is a misuse of, of uh, information from the files. Uh, the judiciary doesn't allow, like as I said, anonymous, um, anonymous uh, access to the files, but uh, this PACER, via PACER access has really um, taken a lot of burden off of clerk's office who in the, in the cases of a big important high profile files would be inundated with people at the desk wanting to go through the file so and many of whom would never get to the head of the line so they get access to the information uh, less burden on the clerk's office it's available but it's available to people who participate through PACER registration now ultimately and, and the reason this came out as judicial conference policy is because uh, uh, as most of you probably know the federal rules promulgation process is lengthy. Uh, it takes years to, to get a federal rule uh, as a federal rule. Uh, and in 2007, uh, actual federal rules uh, were created that mirrored uh, and pretty much promulgated again the same judicial conference policies with a few exceptions. Um, they uh, added a waiver provision which really is, makes express that which was implicit before. If you file something and don't redact it, then you've waived your concern about it being available. Um, it created uh, public access, it created restrictions on immigration uh, case filings by the parties. They were treated like social security cases. Um, and uh, it included uh, an express list of, of items that were exempt uh, from the redaction requirements. Um, now, the Civil Rules Committee basically looks at when the rules are going to change and, and whether there's a need for the change. The CACM committee basically looks at policy decisions uh, relating to the accessibility of public case files among other things and very often the, the CACM committee does studies through the Federal Judicial Center to ascertain what the import and impact of uh, pilot projects relating to uh, public access is. We did some of that um, with regard to the digital audio program that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, but at the behest of the Rules Committee, since the rules have been in place, we have uh, uh, conferred with them and they've conducted some surveys um, with judges and attorneys to ascertain how well these, these rules are working now and whether or not there is a need for further amendment of the federal rules to either expand the redaction requirements, restrict them, change the categories of cases uh, that are uh, subject to redaction and subject to uh, PACER availability. And as of the last joint meeting on privacy between the CACM and, uh, and rules, civil rules, um, all rules, uh, subcommittee, uh, there really is not a demonstrated need yet to do something more in the way of rules amendment uh, and promulgation. But there are concerns and some of these concerns um, are going to take some, some time to figure out exactly how to deal with them. Um, which been based on the surveys that we've taken with the courts and attorneys and, uh, and the feedback we're getting and our discussions with the Rules Committee, there are a lot of things that 
are of import and need to be addressed, but are best left to uh, development at the local level in light of circumstances within different districts uh, to determine how best to handle them. One, one good example is uh, cooperation uh, provisions in plea agreements in criminal cases. Uh, there is concern that there are those who uh, would gain access to the content of a plea agreement that includes cooperation provisions and use that information against the cooperators uh, and uh, thereby disrupt uh, and intimidate uh, criminal trials. Uh, we don't yet have any, uh, there was a high profile um, discussion for a while of a, a website called whosarat.com which uh, purported to uh, identify those who had uh, turned state's evidence or government evidence in criminal trials and sort of single them out for uh, identification and potential intimidation. Um, but there really are as yet we have no reports of actual harm coming to a cooperating uh, defendant or witness or others participating in a criminal trial as a result of PACER access to criminal uh, documents. And, it would be, and that's not to say that, it, that it's impossible that it could happen or that it hasn't happened, but there are so many sources, including uh, the exercise yard in the prison, for that information to get out and around uh, that uh, it's just, it's impossible to tell, but really there's nothing, and again, we can tag this access to the files through the PACER system that shows that there has been any harm resulting uh, as a result of the availability of criminal case files. Now, there are a lot of different approaches to how to deal with sentencing uh, with plea agreements which include cooperation, and I'll wrap this up quickly, but some courts don't make them part of the criminal file. Some of them break the cooperation part off of the plea agreement. Some courts put in a, a dummy docket entry in every case that could be seen as plea agreement and there, it's either going to be blank or sealed or uh, the like. There's a number of steps that can be taken. One of the things that we're working on and have created is a range of options of accessibility for files within, for items within court files, which would enable the, the court not only to just absolutely seal um, a pleading or a, or a document in a file, but to make it available judge and attorneys only, court staff only, one party in the case of an ex parte uh, matter, uh, and the like, which again, trying to give the judges tools to manage and protect privacy while not sealing up cases completely and just saying nobody can see anything that's gone in with it. Um, so uh, we haven't really decided on uh, what the best practices are in, with regard to those, those problems, uh, continuing to study it. Also continuing uh, issues relating to whether alien numbers should be redacted or not. Uh, they're like driver's license numbers for aliens and they come up in the files where aliens are uh, being prosecuted uh, is probably the most uh, likely thing, and courts of appeals very often use those uh, really as identifiers for, for uh, those defendants. Social security numbers, um, you know, we've, we've heard about um, their sensitivity and how uh, they may be able to be replicated from the last four digits if you know where someone was born in the year. Uh, there's a proposal that's under study right now in the bankruptcy uh, area to provide a different unique identifier, uh, not the social security number, or to somehow manage those identifying numbers in a way that uh, is less risky, but nonetheless, that's under study. And as I also indicated, uh, we're talking about different levels of access. And one thing I wanted to ask Susan about was, um, we have rules and we don't have expressed sanctions, and I think we saw some provisions yesterday where there were expressed sanctions for not redacting, but the, our federal rules don't include express provisions for sanctions because they are the rules of procedure and the judge has inherent authority to enforce them uh, and see that they are um, they're observed. And I think we've come up with policy and we've implemented the policy and now the issue is enforcing the policy because, as we say, our policy does put the onus on the people filling the court file to take care with 
what they fill it with, and then our obligation is to make the court file available as much as possible. But Susan, you've, you've seen some instances where there has been enforcement. Yes. Um, there are not a lot of cases out there interpreting the federal rules, the privacy rules, but there are a few. Um, generally, when someone finds a violation of the rule, a social security number that wasn't redacted or some other information that a filer forgot to redact, there are um, a bunch of options that the judges take, sometimes all together, um, sometimes just one or two at a time. But generally, we see some sort of a reminder to the attorneys about the rules uh, and to redact in the future. Um, secondly, they typically remove the document from internet public access. Um, sometimes they seal it, sometimes they just make it available at the clerk's office, but not on PACER, uh, but they do limit that internet access. And when they do that, there's also a requirement that the attorney refile a properly redacted document, usually within a very short time frame, um, as little as 12 hours, sometimes uh, 72 hours. Uh, so they give them a window to get a properly redacted document in the file, so there is still public access through the internet to something. In a few rare cases, there have also been other sanctions uh, against the attorney who failed to redact. We heard um, from our, Manis our Minnesota panel yesterday um, about the decision of the chief judge in the district court there. Um, that's probably the largest sanction, uh, at least that I've found in looking at the cases. Um, that was um, credit monitoring for over 100 people whose social security numbers were accidentally disclosed. Um, interesting thing in that case, the attorney who fought, made that filing was the one who brought the issue to the court to say, wow, in our attachment in this case file, we included this information that wasn't redacted and we should have. So the law firm actually suggested the credit monitoring for a year um, and the judge agreed with that and then also uh, put in a $5,000 donation to a food shelf uh, so that they'll maybe think twice about this next time. Um, there's been one other sanction. Um, this one did not involve money, but I thought it was sort of an interesting remedy. In the Eastern District of New York last July, um, a judge denied a summary judgment motion without prejudice to refile, but denied the motion because of a failure to redact uh, as required by Rule 5.2. Um, they did it in a text order on the docket sheet, which is something that we're able to do with our, our CMECF and PACER systems, um, but it's kind of an unusual case. Um, then there are a couple cases that are pre, well, there are three cases, two of which are pre-rules, so they were under the old privacy policy, where someone moved for sanctions under Rule 11. Um, someone whose information, I think in most cases it was the defendant who made the, the filing that included the social security number, the plaintiff moved for sanctions under Rule 11. Uh, in one of those cases, um, it has survived um, to be examined not under Rule 11, but under a civil contempt sanction, and, and that's not resolved yet. But in the other two, the judges found that the parties hadn't met the safe harbor provisions of Rule 11, and so they denied the sanction motion. In all of those, though, I think it's important to note that once the redaction error was pointed out to the courts, those documents were immediately removed from Internet access, um, again, with a direction to refile the properly redacted document. And I'll just say in, in closing that um, we're not self-satisfied with the policy. It's continually being re-examined both by CACM and we just had this recent interaction with the Rules Committee. We're going to have a, a forum um, at Fordham Law School uh, in a couple of weeks to take even more comment about the current state of privacy and public access in the federal courts. And just Every time you touch one part of it, there's a ripple somewhere else, and we're, we're aware of that. And probably the most, uh, one of the most uh, striking examples of that is with regard to transcripts. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but court reporters make money from selling copies of transcripts. And, but at the same time, when the transcripts have been filed, they're part of the court record. And there was a very delicate extended negotiation that went on for a long time before we hit our current transcript policy, which says you order the transcript, when you get it, you've got so much time to go through it and redact. Again, that's the party who requested and will be filing the transcript's responsibility. But then there's a period of time after, before it's fully available to the public, during which people who want a copy of it have to order it from the, uh, from the court reporter. Uh, not so much a problem with the digital re audio recording, but there are still a lot of court reporters out there and we'd have to balance you know, their issues uh, 
although what we were trying to do was just get public access to court records and find out that there were other dynamics involved that had to be wrestled with. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to move now to our first circuit team uh, with uh, Susan Sullivan and uh, Judge Will Smith from Rhode Island uh, to uh, talk about opinions. And we're going to have to move around uh, as we do these presentations to run them from the center laptop, which means our name tags will be totally redundant shortly. So. Right here. Put one down. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, right there. Sorry. Okay. Good morning. I'm Susan Sullivan. I'm the circuit librarian for the First Circuit U.S. Courts. Um, that includes both the Court of Appeals, the District and Bankruptcy Courts within the First Circuit. I'm not going to ask everyone to tell me what states are in the First <laughs> Circuit, um, but uh, we do cover uh, uh, Maine and New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, and Puerto Rico. Um, Judge Smith and I are going to be talking about opinions and my portion of this presentation, and I, will, uh, I would really like to have Judge Smith um, speak the most is to just give us a little bit of a review of, of all of the thousands of, of uh, documents that are in PACER um, and are uh, really generally known as court records. There are those uh, documents that we call written opinions or uh, again those uh, documents that are going to be used um, and available to the uh, public, to lawyers, to attorneys, um, uh, any number of individuals out there on the web to do legal research. So I'm coming from a little bit of different perspective. Um, I'm coming from uh, uh, certainly this perspective of helping individuals find opinions. So uh, with first we have to talk a little bit about um, uh, generally how many decisions are issued by federal judges per year and then how many of these are considered a written opinion of the court. I don't have a number. I didn't uh, pull out a number. And you will find various numbers of uh, certainly how many decisions are issued and then uh, particularly how many written opinions. But this is the definition that has been approved by the Judicial Conference of the United States. Um, and it says that a written opinion is defined as any document issued by a judge or judges of the court sitting in that capacity that sets forth a reasoned explanation for a court's decision. Um, pretty good definition, at least in my personal uh, 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 opinion. But um, there's, it's, it's, perhaps the word debate is a little um, a harsh word to use, but there is a difference in interpretation of them. And I think uh, two of the clarifications that came with that approval of the definition is the responsibility for determining which documents meet this def definition rests with the authoring judge. And um, certain judges are going to uh, look at um, documents. Um, some judges may hold back and not tag certain uh, documents as written opinions, whereas other judges may um, actually tag as a written opinion almost every document that they, they issue. Um, and certainly the decision as to whether a document meets this definition is not the same. This is another clarifying point about whether an opinion is to be published. And I really am not going to go into published versus unpublished and get off on, on that whole debate. But that's also something that takes place um, at the time that the um, uh, judge is deciding uh, whether it is going to be tagged as a written opinion. If anyone has any, on the panel has any comments about the definition, I would be uh, happy for them to, to chime in. I, I certainly was not in on the writing of the definition, so. Actually, I was in on the writing of the definition <laughs> a little bit, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't do that many written opinions, because one thing this has done is it's really gotten me to rule from the bench, and now uh, with the uh, digital audio availability, that's, that's not really cover either. And also, it reasoned, and I go, well, if, I say it's reasoned, yeah, I guess I have to publish it, but 
if everybody else finds it completely unreasonable, you know. <laughs> well, I, I actually had a big hand in the first crafting of this definition, and I thought it was workable, but the empirical evidence would be to the contrary, because when you run uh, searches against the databases of various courts, you find similar sized courts uh, that will have three opinions in a year versus 14,000. So obviously we're not all on the uh, same slate at this point, and I've actually suggested some language that might uh, push the ball a little for further uh, uh, up the road, but, uh, but we'll see. I, I think we ought to tie it more to opinions that in our view would have precedential value for or useful value for subsequent cases, uh, not just because that case itself appears to be reasoned, but, but we'll see. Yeah, and I, I'm just, to take the other side of this, we're if we're talking about transparency and these opinions are available at no charge because they are the court's disposition of a matter, then I don't think they need to be a precedential matter. People should be able to see what the everyday garden variety mill run case reasoning right. is. And, well, the, and to take the other side, uh, what you've done is reinvented practical obscurity because you've created an opinion database that has so much trivia in it that you can't find anything useful. So, yeah. uh, Jim and I are good friends and we frequently don't see it the same way. I, I, but I, <laughs> the friend part or the opinion part? <laughs> the, uh, I think that the reason for the disparity is a lack of consistent protocol in chambers right. and a judge's inattention to the judicial conference policy that requires him or her to take a look and either designate something as opinion or say that's really just an order. But I, and I think that if they took that step within each chambers, you'd find those statistics would equalize, right. but rather than just inattention. Enough so. of the Jim and Rich show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Something to, to think about. So anyway, these are just some types of documents that if you actually have looked at a written opinion report uh, in PACER, um, you will find sort of these descriptive words there. There really is a variety if you, if you look across the, uh, across the courts. Um, this is just a, a, a diagram or a, a chart that uh, explains that the judge or the panel, if it's a court of appeals, uh, designates something as a written opinion. Um, it is then loaded and uh, they work through CM, uh, ECF. Um, it then appears in PACER. The availability then of these documents that have been designated as written opinion, which again um, uh, are orders, memoranda, uh, decisions and so forth, um, they're available through PACER, they are definitely available for the from the individual court websites, and then obviously they're also available through the fee services or um, uh, certain free uh, websites that uh, also gather the federal court opinions. Um, this is just an example of a, 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 a district court website, the District of Idaho, uh, Judge Smith chose <laughs> Idaho, um, and if you'll notice, um, uh, if you're at the site, you do uh, find where it says written decisions. Now, even this terminology of written decisions will be different at different websites. Some will have uh, a link or a button that says um, opinions. Some say written decisions. It, 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 there is a little bit of a confusion when you're at a website for the first time, but obviously the more you use that particular jurisdiction, um, you'll know exactly where to go. Um, then there are the district court written decisions, there's also bankruptcy written decisions. Um, you have a choice of, of, you, of how you get to those decisions. I'm going to very briefly mention CourtWeb, which I don't know that uh, everyone knows about, but um, CourtWeb was developed uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania Middle District, um, and what it is, it is a way in which uh, there are, are 16 courts, um, and then it's up to the individual judge within those courts um, to contribute or put their uh, written opinions into this court web. So there is a way in which you can, if your particular court or the court you're interested in is in, uh, in court web, where you can do a quick search, you can do a more thorough full text search. Uh, but again, if you want to cross jurisdiction and do some searching, you certainly can do it through um, court web. Um, you can also um, just pick out a particular judge um, whose decisions you want to see. Um, you do get a search result. Um, this happens to be a particular case, the Blanc v. Jerome case, and you can bring up, I did not create a slide that, that showed the actual uh, uh, opinion itself. Other choice is, is, of course, through PACER. 
Um, and uh, again, it's been explained that you do have to register for PACER um, and that there are some uh, fees involved, but there are no fees for the text of written opinions. So again, the category of written opinions is, is, can be quite broad, and it's not just those documents that we're used to seeing in the Federal Reporter or the Federal Supplement um, uh, or, uh, uh, again, uh, more the more traditional uh, documents that we see uh, even on LexisNexis and Westlaw. Um, so you certainly have your link to PACER. Uh, you do have to log in to PACER. Um, I chose, um, just for this demonstration, to look at the U.S. Party Case Index, and I know that there are going to be uh, a little bit of information about the new searchability in the U.S. Party Case Index. Um, and uh, in this instance, again, we chose to, to look at the jurisdiction of Rhode Island, and uh, Judge Smith was involved in a case um, uh, that, in, I'm sorry, he was the judge in a case that involved the town of Narragansett. Um, we did, in fact, um, find the case. Um, this is just following through um, as you're working through PACER. Uh, you you um, bring up the, the docket report, you run the report, um, and uh, then you can actually get now a sense of also the entries in the, the full docket report. You know, you do have to search a little bit to find the opinion in the order, but it is there in full, te um, uh, full text. This just shows that you're no not being charged if you're going to bring up this document, and here, in fact, is, is the document that is available through PACER. Um, Fee-based research services. I'm not going to dwell on these. We know that there's Westlaw. We know there's LexisNexis. Bloomberg Law is now also in the business. Lois Law um, is available. Uh, Lexis One, um, there is a free case feature within Lexis One. Um, and so again, there uh, may be other fee-based services, but this is the core fee-based services that uh, we generally talk about. Um, other sources, um, these would be free sources on the web. Find Law, I'm sure, uh, hopefully, uh, many of you have, have heard of Find Law because it also does cover uh, state cases. Uh, if you go to the Fine Law site, um, you choose Browse Cases and Codes. Again, we're looking for the um, uh, district court decisions from Rhode Island. Um, and you work on uh, your way down, um, and you will find the text of the opinions. What it does, what all of these um, free websites do, is to take you to the court's website. Um, and then you can find the actual text of the decision. Justia is another um, uh, a source that you can use to get to uh, federal court uh, decisions or cases. Um, and again, this is just the sort of path that you would follow. Um, and in fact, uh, this was when, from Fine Law, from Justia, when I got to the um, link to the Rhode Island uh, uh, District Court's website, and I ran the search of Town of Narragansett near uh, URI, the University of Rhode Island. Um, and so uh, I was able to, to this query to come up with this result. Um, and in fact, this is the, uh, case that, that, the case that was um, highlighted was the case that we were looking for. Again, for the sake of, of brevity, I didn't uh, make screen uh, captures of all of this. Other sources, the um, Legal Information Institute, which is for, for years has really been uh, working to um, bring all kinds of primary um, legal documents uh, 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 out into the, uh, onto the web and available with a, a reasonable uh, search engine uh, in order to, to find the cases. Um, Altlaw um, was another source. Uh, I, I didn't bring it with me, but if you go to the Altlaw um, uh, homepage, they had a statement about um, they felt that they were done with what they had set out to do um, and that you know, they were really just a very small group from Columbia Law School. They had done and accomplished what they wanted to do and so I don't know what the, the future of alt law will be. Um, Google Scholar, we all know that recently um, Google Scholar has um, added uh, opinions. Um, and so uh, that is another way in which, not every single opinion, but certainly it's another way in which we can get. Um, precedent is no longer available. Um, I don't know if any of you knew about precedent. It really was only in existence for a very short period of time. It looked pretty good, but um, I, I believe that they, uh, they are no longer um, uh, in, in business. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have, have that uh, alternate source to look at also. 
Um, this is just the US uh, courts.gov. Uh, if you do want to get any, to any of the court websites to get to their opinions, you can come here um, and you can choose whichever uh, jurisdiction you want. Um, future partnerships in terms of uh, getting the, the opinions out onto the web uh, in, in, in a more authenticated version, maybe through GPO FEDSYS. Um, the Federal Depository Library Program, there was the PACER pilot that um, we uh, hope to um, start again. Um, there could be a partnership with the Law Library of Congress, and also there could be more partnership with Google Scholar. So there really is an effort, I think, by the courts to try to get out onto the web available to not attorneys, but really in, in many instances to um, individuals who are, who are representing themselves in court, um, a, a lower cost or, or a free way to get to opinions. It will, it will take some time, but I'm sure that we will accomplish that. I'm going to turn it over to Judge Smith. All right, I can stay right here. Okay. Thanks. All right, well, my role here is uh, uh, hopefully just to give you a little bit of a picture of where the future of opinions uh, might be going and uh, uh, to give you a, uh, maybe a little window into that and then talk just very, very briefly about uh, how that might impact the system that Susan just uh, reviewed for you. So uh, typically we think of opinions as uh, written documents and solely composed of, of uh, the written words. The advent of the internet, over the last 10 years or so, we've begun to see creeping in uh, references to internet sources, and that's typically done through what we uh, know as uh, hyperlinks or, or hot links. And uh, thousands of uh, cases have now, uh, that are reported in the federal system, have uh, various kinds of uh, hot links in them. I'll get to that in just, just a moment. The second thing we're gonna talk about is sort of the, a newer uh, uh, phenomenon is uh, audiovisual that has been housed on a, a, a permanently housed on a court server and uh, uh, specifically I'm going to show you what the US Supreme Court has done in that regard in a, a case called Scott versus Harris and then finally uh, what I think is sort of the, the, the new generation of opinions which um, I'm going to show you a, a part of an opinion that uh, I worked on uh, I wrote and developed along with the help of uh, IT folks, including Wendell and folks in my court. So, uh, and that involves embedding audio and visual inside of the opinion to create a multimedia opinion that is not just uh, a composed of a written word. So with respect to hyperlinks, we all have seen this. Uh, Susan, in, uh, as a great librarian, uh, managed to pull up a number of opinions. She keeps a list of this sort of thing. Only a librarian would keep a list uh, of, uh, of this kind of thing. Uh, and there are thousands, literally thousands of opinions um, that uh, I had a law clerk do a search and uh, came up with a thousand hits for www. Uh, so we know that that's going on, uh, uh, going on a lot out there, uh, but of course, uh, this works as long as the website stays stable and, and whatever it is that uh, you're linking to is still there a year from now. Uh, I pulled out an opinion that um, uh, I had put some hot links into just uh, they, they weren't central to the outcome of the case. I just wanted to check and see if they were still there. Uh, I used YouTube and my advice is don't link to YouTube because things that are there uh, one day are not there the next. So. Uh, um, it, as I said, it wasn't central, uh, but still even more stable things could disappear and not be at these sites. So that's a little bit, um, uh, a little bit unst unstable may not be the right word, but you, you're not going to be assured that uh, whatever uh, you've linked to is actually going to be there uh, 10 years from now when someone is looking at the opinion. <clears throat> Now the next uh, generation, I think very interesting development was when the Supreme Court in, uh, in a case that involved a car stop, uh, sort of a debate between the justices uh, in the majority and Justice Stevens who was uh, writing a dissent about uh, what occurred in the, in the car stop, uh, the court put a, a footnote in that, uh, uh, that said, uh, Justice Stevens 
suggests that our reaction to the videotape is somehow idiosyncratic and seems to believe that we are misrepresenting its contents. <coughs> Quoting the dissent, in sum, the factual statements by the Court of Appeals quoted by the court were entirely accurate. We are happy to allow the videotape to speak for itself. And it cites to the record exhibit and then uh, gives you a, a web link that takes you to the Supreme Court's website. So this is kind of interesting. If you hit this web link, you put it in your, in your search bar, uh, it actually will begin to download the video for you. And I had a little trouble getting this, uh, uh, getting access to this the first time I did it, but uh, was eventually able to, uh, to, uh, to view the video. Uh, the video will download to your computer and what you'll see here is not the entire video, but this is what you'll get as you, uh, uh, now this will be on your computer, and this is the tail end of the car stop chase. All right, so what's interesting about this, in my view, is uh, you can see the obvious power of, of having a video with audio uh, that you're able to view as you're reading the opinion and, and, and just think about the difference in terms of how this explains what happened versus uh, actually reading the judge writing about what happened. A car chased, it ran into the back of the other car, it went down an embankment, it crashed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is obviously much more, much more powerful, but the technology that is the, um, uh, uh, what the court uh, did here <clears throat> isn't perfect. It, it, it takes the video, it houses it onto, uh, onto the Supreme Court's own server, and you have to then link to that server. You can then download it to your computer. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a step above linking to some outside external source. <clears throat> so it's a move in the right direction. This was two, 2007. Now, uh, I had a case involving a, a patent dispute involving Microsoft uh, and a technology um, <clears throat> called product activation. If any of you have ever um, you know, installed Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office in a computer, you might have gone through the product activation uh, process. Uh, this case has uh, been presiding over for about uh, six years. It finally ended up in a, in a jury trial. Uh, the jury uh, rendered a verdict in favor of the plaintiff Unilock for $388 million. And uh, <clears throat> there, was a, there were a number of, of, of issues in the case, but one of the most critical issues in the case was whether the Microsoft technology, which is known as uh, MD5 or SH1, um, th which are what are called uh, one-way cryptographic uh, algorithms. And what a one-way cryptographic algorithm is, I'm sure most of you know this, but I'll just, <laughs> <coughs> maybe I should turn to Judge Leonard or Judge Hayes, <laughs> Haynes, to tell us. Don't you just have a video? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to that. <laughs> so in, in words, what this algorithm is, uh, what it does is you can pour any amount of data into one of these algorithms, and, and what you will get out is a 128-bit, uh, the MD5 is a 128-bit, which I think is 16 characters, uh, uh, string of numbers, essentially. And, and any amount of data can go in, the contents of the New York City phone book, feature-length films, uh, the entire contents of a public library can all go into the algorithm and out will come a 16-character uh, uh, digest. <clears throat> now, it's one way because you can't go back the other way and figure out what the contents were that you put in. So the question is, in the case, whether the one-way cryptographic algor algorithms of MD5 and SH1 were those summation algorithms or a summer or an equivalent, all right? Now, <clears throat> Uh, the jury said yes, and on a uh, uh, motion for judgment uh, uh, as a matter of law, uh, uh, I overturned the jury's verdict. This is a schematic, a simple schematic of the 
uh, the product activation technology. And I'm not sure you can fully see it on the screen up there, but the, the issue is whether where you see the MD5 hashing algorithms on either side of the, of the, uh, of the system, on the remote side and on the Microsoft Clearinghouse side, uh, they have to be the same, and are they performing a summation uh, task? This is a, another schematic. This is, both of these are actually in the opinion uh, that I wrote. This is the description of the, uh, of the uh, patented technology, which is the summer, that is, a series of numbers added to each other, and they equal a registration number. So the question is, is this what was in the patent? Is that violated by the, the Microsoft uh, technology, uh, that, that is, the, MD, the MD5 and the SHA-1? And I found that the MD5 was not, and the SHA-1 were not, uh, SH-1, I should say, were not uh, summers or, or their equivalents. And, and the, the problem, uh, challenge that I faced was how do I explain this because it's very very complicated so during the trial <coughs> uh, uncontested testimony from a professor a computer science professor at uh, Rice University uh, uh, described how these algorithms work and uh, he used an animation that was very effective and that computer animation was shown to the jury through a laptop, use, utilizing the, the, the courtroom technology that we're, uh, we're very uh, privileged to be able to, to use in the federal courts. This animation was very effective, but he explained the animation as he, as he went through it. So <clears throat> the problem was, how could I use this, uh, this animation? Uh, and uh, I thought that would be more effective than explaining how the algorithm worked in, uh, in words only. So I, in the opinion, uh, there is a description of, of the algorithm, and you come to a point where you see this screenshot. This is the first screenshot from the, from the video animation that Professor um, Wallach used uh, in his testimony. And as you're looking at this on the computer, oh, that's right, one more page. You look at this schematic. This is a schematic of MD5. Uh, so what I did, <coughs> along with, as I said, the great help of Wendell at the AO and my own IT people in my court. We took this, this animation and then we married it with the digital audio of Professor Wallach's testimony during trial. And we created a movie. And then we took the movie and we embedded it inside of the, the opinion. So this is actually in the opinion, this isn't a link to anything. It's not on a server, and it's not in, uh, at the court or, or any external source. It's actually inside of the opinion. And this is what you get when you're looking at the opinion uh, on the, uh, on, the on, on your, your computer. All right. Let's uh, proceed to the next slide, please. So this is the voice of. Uh, you're now going to hear so now I'm showing you Professor the Wallach different functions. These are mathematical functions expressed in terms of bitwise logical operations. So let me explain that. So what I'm what trying to like do here is show that up, that's logical and MD5 is not the, just a summation. Like it's not just a addition. V shape. That's right. a logical or, and the one that looks like a line with a little hook down this part. That's actually a not. And the, the final mathematical operator, oops, I, I missed. And that, this goes that on for. Plus inside of a circle. This is about a 12 minute movie. Exclusive or. That uh, so runs the through the entire operation, steps, but you're just going to get a flavor rounds use the F of what he's doing. Function. Then the next 16 use G, the next 16 use H, the next 16 use I. What's important about all of these functions is all of them are expressed in terms of three inputs, x, y, and z. So three bits in, or three truth values in. All right, so I think you get, you get the drift. <clears throat> uh, the explanatory power of that video is so, so much greater than what you could achieve just with the, with the written word. Uh, so what about looking at the, uh, the opinion and how you get to it? What I've found in just testing out some things is you, the best way to view it is obviously through the court's website. Pacer, you can get to it, but it's pretty slow. 
because it contains so much memory. And it's really totally inadequate with uh, Westlaw and Nex uh, LexisNexis. This is what you get when you get, go search this opinion um, on Westlaw. You find the opinion, and then where the movie is, it basically says that it's an, it's an image, a picture. And you have to uh, 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 click the, to view the picture, and you will get the, uh, this is the Lexus uh, screenshot. You'll get the picture, but you don't get any of the video. <clears throat> so just to wrap up, um, I think we're entering potentially a new generation where not just use of web uh, hot links um, and server um, housed video, but even video and audio embedded in opinions uh, is really going to change the way we're, we're going to create opinions. Uh, the reason we can do this is all the advancements in courtroom technology that we have been able to uh, enjoy over the last few years. Digital audio, which you can hear more about, and the, uh, and the video. But we need to invest more uh, so that we'll be able to access all of this <clears throat> and utilize it to its uh, uh, fullest potential, both the government and uh, in the, pr in the private services. So that's it. Thank you. Will, thank you, Susan. Uh, now we're going to move to talk about uh, digital audio, uh, Wendell. Do I need to switch seats? No, I think, I think we're okay. I think Wendell's I think we're okay. If, okay. Give me just a second. Good morning. Um, for anyone who's unaware, uh, digital audio is a method of taking and recording information using computers and a sound system. Uh, I have it pointed this way because two of the judges that uh, were involved in the pilot are sitting to my right. So I'm hoping they'll chime in and, and interrupt me in anything I get incorrect as well. Since 1999, digital audio has been a method that was approved for taking the record in federal court. Um, those courts that use digital audio uh, allow the public to get a copy of any audio of any hearing, as long as it's not sealed, for a cost of $26. This pilot is really an extension of that, of that access that's already available. The pilot was approved in March of 1997, and uh, in July we were posting audio files. Now, I know that the mantra of this conference is that <laughs> state courts are the birthplace of innovation, but to go from authorization to implementation in four months, that's kind of cool. We had five courts that originally started in the pilot, and we had two that joined us later in the year. And we had some initial policy questions <clears throat> when we all met at the start of this. Uh, the ones that are applicable here are which audio file should be made available? Uh, is there an interest in this type of file or record from the court? And how should redaction be handled? Well, it was very early, very early it was evident that uh, the decision of what audio should be made available had to rest with the presiding judge. We also were able to determine that because we had disparate digital audio systems in the courts, the audio we would make available would be an MP3. And the audio we're making available would be a copy of what the court had as their official record. So the audio file that we're making available on PACER was there for convenience for the public. It was not the official court record. Sorry. And redaction. The courts followed <clears throat> pretty much an all or nothing focus with redaction. If there was sensitive information that was provided in the court hearing, the audio file was just not uploaded. The best practice was to <coughs> excuse me, remind attorneys beforehand that they should not uh, introduce that information. Now someone may say, wait a second, I heard Peter Martin talk about an audio file, I actually heard the audio file where a judge mentioned the name of a minor from this digital audio pilot. Now if you heard that presentation, what you didn't hear was that for a year preceding that, the plaintiffs and their attorneys had changed the caption in the case to remove the initials and actually list the minor by name. And they did that in all their pleadings for the year leading up to the hearing that was played in that presentation. So in that case, 
It was information we might think was uh, sensitive, but the parties in that case had made it very clear that they did not consider it sensitive information. And that's why, in that particular audio, the judge would have posted it, even though he had mentioned the minor by name. Let me just say, this all or nothing uh, aspect of posting the digital audio on PACER for access through the docket is not necessarily all of a day or all of a, all of, uh, a morning. For example, in bankruptcy court, we have many days that we will hear 100 or more cases on motions hearings in the span of a morning session, say. And the technology that Wendell's worked so hard to get in place will divide up the audio files by case number so that each case number, each case separately has its own maybe 30 second, maybe five minute audio file attached at the, at the hearing spot on the docket. And the, and the judge will determine whether or not he or she will post that one for that case, not, not affecting all the other cases that came that day, which, as to which he or she will make the call as well. And the redaction policy is a little more nuanced because uh, you can use your discretion to determine what a session is. So for instance, if you know uh, in a trial that's ongoing, you have an hour of sensitive testimony coming up that you just can't avoid, uh, you can break your sessions to treat that as a separate session not post it, but uh, still post the prior two hours of that morning. Thank you. As we went through this, we found there were three areas that we needed to raise awareness. The first was with attorneys, and that involved reminding the attorneys that the audio files would be made available, and the way we reminded them were they were reminded in court. There were also notices posted, excuse me, outside the courtroom, and <coughs> Excuse me. And also at the council tables. The second group that we want to raise awareness with was with the public and with the media. And that happened rather straightforwardly. We sent out press releases, and that uh, was, I don't want to say promulgated by word of mouth. And in at least one high profile case in Nebraska, the local station downloaded the audio file from PACER put it on their website, mentioned it on their news station, and directed people to go to their website to hear the entire hearing after playing just a clip during the news show. And thirdly, we needed to raise the awareness of court staff. This was new for some of us uh, as we went through this, actually new for all of us. In one instance, we had a hearing where a judge was looking at reducing the time that someone was being incarcerated. They had been a cooperating witness. And in this case, the defendant appeared, <coughs> excuse me, appeared from uh, jail telephonically. And after the hearing was done, the judge uh, and the courtroom deputy left the courtroom and allowed the attorney to talk to his client so that he could avoid a trip in, they could talk about what they wanted. No one turned off the video, uh, excuse me, the audio. So that was heard. And, so we changed some of our internal practices. We don't start the audio until the judge is just about to enter the chambers. We make sure we turn the audio off. Those were things that we had to have as court awareness so that we weren't providing more information than, uh, than was actually on the record or should have been on the record. We found a number of benefits as we went through this that went beyond just providing more information to the public. Uh, for the courts, there was additional transparency and for court staff, it was easier to access a recording because they were used to getting it off the docket. They were on the docket all day, and that was a very convenient place for them to find it. Uh, well, there was benefit for judges. I'll, I get to speak for the judges here. <laughs> um, including, in addition, there was additional transparency there, but, um, oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Uh, it, judges use it to refresh their recollection, I'm told, and also to direct counsel, to direct counsel at times that they need to re refresh their recollection before they uh, came to court or were going to submit a, a proposed order. Uh, there were benefits for the bar. Uh, attorneys were downloading these audios, listening to them um, on their iPods. Uh, I'm sure there was some counsel who was downloading it saying, yeah, I sound good there. 
but it also allowed them to be prepared if they were substituting for someone else to know what happened in the hearing the last time they were in court. The benefit to the media was that it was readily available, and we had cases where judges heard their voices on the radio as they went home. Uh, these were from that day's hearings. The media had downloaded them and were playing a snippet, uh, thereby adding more transparency to the activities that went on in the courtroom. I would say that judge has got a problem with the presets on his radio. But, uh. <laughs> The benefit of the public is that there's now an easier and more inexpensive way to hear what happens in the courtroom. And we had attorneys who said their clients were not appearing in court with them, but were checking up on them by going on and listening to the audio file so they could hear how their attorney represented them in court. We also have some law professors who would download the audios and could actually use it as a teaching mechanism to show what actually happened in the courtroom as they were teaching their students. I have a couple of real life, exam or real life examples that I'd like to mention. Uh, during this pilot, we had uh, the Chrysler case come up. And within five days of having the judge say that he would like to participate in the pilot, we had systems folks from South Carolina go up to New York North City. Carolina. I'm sorry, yes, Judge. North Carolina Eastern <laughs> District. Uh, please don't tell them I said that. And uh, they went up. Within two days had the system installed, up and running, tested, worked with the staff, and that ended up being very successful. Uh, that court, there were only 30 audio files. Uh, they started with the first hearing that GM had, excuse me, first hearing Chrysler had. Uh, between the two cases, there were 30 audio files. They were downloaded over a total of 1,000 times. And we also received calls from attorneys saying, can we post this on our site so that our clients can go there and hear it? And of course they could. We also had a case regarding Senator Fumo in Pennsylvania. This was a, I guess I can call it a corruption case since he was convicted, it's no longer an uh, alleged corruption case. And that case received also wide interest, especially in Pennsylvania. Um, when I called someone from the court and asked them what would be memorable from that case, someone who heard almost all of the hearings, they suggested that I choose this clip to play for you. Did he use the credit card? Yes. Uh, we're, at Green Street, uh, were there vacuum cleaners? Yes. Uh, what kind of vacuum cleaner? All right. And uh, how many were there? Uh, one on every floor. And what about at the, uh, at the other location? In they, were, they were there too, yeah. Same vacuum cleaner? Yes. Florida? Yes. How many were there? Florida, two. Uh, Kenyon Avenue? Kenyon Avenue, there was two there as well. And what about uh, Ventnor? At the, at the docks? At you the know? docks. Uh, I'm not sure. I, didn't, I was just there at the workshop mainly. There. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's not just that he had a lot of vacuum cleaners. There were other issues in this case, but this was what they remembered. <laughs> um, the fact that he had the same vacuum cleaner everywhere and was using the credit card to get it. Um, but this case also had another twist. Uh, after the case, this case went on for 70 days. After this case had been going on and the jury was deliberating, it was determined, or a motion was filed, to stop deliberation because one of the jurors was posting on Facebook that they were deliberating. And I have in front of you the, is the order that was uh, filed, the document for that. But what they did is they had an in-chambers hearing uh, to discuss this, and they also put that on Pacer. So I'd like to play a, a clip from that because this, to me, was just intriguing that I would get to hear what happened in the chambers because obviously the entire galley could not have gone in there. Obviously, the ones last week that were taken down do look like he's at least reporting on the fact of, of deliberation. That he's what? That he's reporting on the fact of deliberation, yeah. that they are deliberating. Uh, what I want to discuss, uh, gentlemen and ladies, is how we go about uh, this procedure today of interviewing uh, the juror. Does anybody have any suggestions about it? Uh, well, before you answer that question, let me say this. My thought was that I was going to bring him in here and in a very general sense uh, tell him why he's here and then invite questioning from the attorneys. 
Now, if you don't want to, or I will ask you a lot of questions, okay? but the, 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 uh, the thought is that my thought was that because of the technical nature of this, which I think I understand, but I'm sure I'm not a whistle, that uh, the attorneys might want to ask questions. Do I know the hesitance in that? Our preference would be that Your Honor do the preliminary questioning and then we will follow up. If, if well, that's, yeah, that's what I may, may I say first for the record that our position is we should be able to court, even now, even though we're on the record. Yeah, that, 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 this that is, is such an obvious public interest and importance. And, and that is, in my, my opinion is that's obviously wrong. Okay. Uh, As because I think the jury deliberations remain the most secret and sacred thing. Oh, I'm sorry, system. not the... <laughs> so it, it goes on, but then it was made available. Um, there is one other clip that I like to play for, it's about 30 seconds, and it kind of gives you a, a feel that not everything that goes on in the courtroom is completely serious, um, and if you're going to listen to these audio files, you'll never know what you're going to hear. Um, The tax returns. Uh, there are sufficient funds to close out the case promptly, and we will be doing so. So I think that the status conference has served its purpose by goosing performance. We can call it a goosing conference. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, I do see. Okay. Um, any further comment? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Spider. All right. Thanks, Wendell. Thanks, Judge Haynes. Uh, look, this is something that Judge Haynes and I have been heavily involved in, and uh, as we sit here today, we do believe it's on the brink of being approved by the Judicial Conference uh, coming out of the pilot stage in a couple of weeks so that any court in the country, in the federal system that uses digital audio, can begin to make uh, these recordings available. We could talk about it all day. I think it's absolutely revolutionary in terms of the look into federal courts that you're going to be able to remotely have, but uh, we'll see where we go and I'm sure talk about it in future years. Um, Wendell, you want to uh, talk a little bit about the part, new party case index? We'll have yeah, to go gonna, fast because we're uh, I, I think out I can of time. do this one yeah. fast. Um, we have a U.S. party case index, which you may have seen, you saw it in an earlier slide, which receives about 200,000 <coughs> queries a day. Um, the system is very good at finding an individual case. It allows you to look across courts. So if I were wanting to find a case with Wesley Snipes' criminal situation, it gives me a list, and if I were to click on the third case down, I would get to see the docket for the case where he uh, had a criminal case in Florida. The thing the party case index isn't great at is giving me a list of cases based on just a date range. If I were to do that, I get a response I'm not looking for. So in the words of Will Smith, old and busted, new hottie. This is a new United States party case index. And I can still get the same list that I would if I were looking for uh, Wesley Snipes' case. But there are other things I can do here as well. It has more search features. I can search on all of these fields. And I'm going to, uh, well, I'll go back there. Uh, if I were to want to get all of the cases, bankruptcy cases in the country for the first five months of last year, I can run that query and it will come back with 400,000 cases for me. I then have the option to download those if I wanted to. And if I decide I want to download them, it'll tell me the, the pacer charge that it would have. And it gives me three options that I believe weren't available before. I can get them in XML. I can get them in text or CSV. I'm not quite sure what CSV looks like. Um, but I know I've seen it on some equipment I've had. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is on the potty case index, if I run that same query for all the bankruptcy courts in the first and second circuit, I get a much smaller number, 40,000 cases, or excuse me, 34,000 cases. But I can filter those results, and I can look at the courts that are making that up, and if I were to click on one of those, it will allow me to see just a list from that court. And that's coming out in the very near future. We'll keep our fingers crossed for March 15th. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah I hate to announce the date, but. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Now, uh, Mr. Shockian is going to run us through uh, the uh, user survey we're coming to the end of. Uh, PACER over the years has always sought the uh, advice uh, of its users, and we have convened work groups and task force all around the country, uh, more or less informally. This is the first time we've actually gone out to an outside consulting firm and uh, to get an unbiased and objective view. Uh, paid them a fair amount of money to go out and look and talk to our entire user base and come back and tell us how our users see us. And it's not quite done, but we have some preliminary results that are worth looking at. Right, and I'll speak quickly. <laughs> Pacer has been around for a long time. It's over 20 years old now. Uh, we've grown. We've grown up in 1988 from 12 courts in a bulletin board system. It grew slowly at first, 9,000 users, and as you've already heard, we've hit the million registered account mark. Can we have the PowerPoint displayed, please? Oh. Yeah, I think it's not logged in here is the problem. Oh, oh. Thank you, sorry. That's technology, make sure it's plugged in. Yeah. Moving it around. Uh-oh. OK, perfect. So. You can see clearly how much we have grown, and that's just the last 11 years. Pacer, how big are we? We provide, are you seeing that? I haven't a clue how to get that off, oh. but. No, you have to go, I don't know. Did you capture it? You must have captured it. <coughs> okay. Well, it provides access to 30 million cases, over a half a billion documents and 700 million docket entries. As you can see, our usage by court type, back in the day it was mostly bankruptcy, now we're nearly a 50-50 split. Actually, maybe this will work. All right, well, why delay? Apologize. All right. How big are we? How many calls do we get? We, we register about 3,000 accounts a week. That's growing to 5,000. 5,000 emails a month. We take 135,000 support calls annually at our service center. So we have this assessment. We want to know our users better. We don't even categorize them today. We wanted to gauge their satisfaction, and we wanted to know what more they want from us. We had several different research methods we used, including qualitative research with 234 key users, some of whom are in this room. We did a demographic survey we, uh, to find out more about who our users were, how they're using PACER. We did a service center survey for four months. Everybody who contacted the PACER service center was invited to take either a telephonic or an email survey. We went out with what we called the mini survey, the proactive survey to everyone. Um, it was up for everybody. And that was all 350,000 of our active accounts. Uh, and then finally, the PACER user satisfaction survey, that was a random sample survey. So briefly on the results, who uses PACER? Well, as it happens, 75% of our users uh, fall within the legal sector or the litigants themselves, and then uh, followed up by 10% of commercial businesses, and then the rest of the user populations, which are, pretty, which are pretty small. What do people use PACER for? A whopping 76% are following a case on PACER, and nearly half of our users are searching across the courts or searching across cases. What were our strengths? And we started with the qualitative research. I'll tell you, this pretty much followed right through all of the survey tools we had, but we're reliable, stable, and flexible. And we are the complete, authentic, and accurate source. And I want to take a minute. You know, everybody talks about PACER. I think the real important takeaway of PACER, we're talking about court records. We're not talking about copies. We're not, we are, except where it's very explicit, like with digital audio, we're talking about how the public accesses court records, and that's recognized. Um, we do have areas for improvement. We acknowledge that, and they were made very clear to us that these also followed through. We get it. Our user interface was, was put out there over 10 years ago, and in internet time, we know that's too old. We have search limitations. 
we need more consistency across the courts, and that's going to be a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> And frankly, we don't do our best at communicating, and we're going we're gonna to work to change that. The proactive survey results, we're pretty excited by this because this survey was widely batted around and frankly was advertised from um, what we thought were some of our, our less exuberant users. As it turns out, 86% uh, were at least somewhat satisfied with, with PACER itself. They also, again, the results tracked right through. Um, it's a fast, efficient way to get information. Uh, it provides the accessibility. However, there are changes to be made. Once again, you'll see the user interface. There was a nod to the pricing and billing. The search is right there, the standardization consistency across courts. This was, now these are the random survey results, a little bit different. You can see that um, our, our, our biggest fans are, in, are the creditors and the service providers to the legal sector. Uh, the legal sector themselves and the commercial businesses are, are pretty happy. You can see that our highest dissatisfaction, this was interesting, is among the educational and research institution and students. That's not shocking because frankly the system was developed for the legal sector. So. There you have it. Um, they suggested a number of enhancements. Again, they follow, expand the search capabilities. You see, we see this over and over and over again. And they were specific. We took the comments, and these have been summarized, but we've been very careful to pull out the comments so that as we make our changes, we have specifics. Um, again, these are the comments I was just speaking of. On the ease of use, we've pulled out the very specific things we need to start working on. This is what we call the ease of use or user interface, the search capabilities, some of the suggestions for additional standardization or consistency across the courts. The PACER Service Center, um, for those of you in the state courts who are providing uh, direct support to your users, Apparently, sir, uh, what we found, a key driver of satisfaction was if folks are using the PACER Service Center, not all of our users do by any means, they are happier than the people who aren't using the PACER Service Center. So we say use the PACER Service Center if you're not happy, they'll help. Um, the other key driver we found was Frequent users are happier users because, of course, they're more familiar with the system. Now, since PACER really are the read access as to what we keep in the court's case management systems. We can start making changes to PACER now. We have started already. The party case index that we'll be releasing on the Ides of March of all days. Um, it's a step in the right direction, but that's going to be, there are going to be regular updates at various intervals. However, I hasten to add, there's only so far we can go until we retool the underlying system. And with right. that, I'll turn it over to Judge Leonard. Well, I kept my section for last so I could delete it, which will be necessary. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say about two minutes worth of where we are. Uh, the federal courts is uh, involved already in this internal and massive effort to scope out and build the next generation of case management software realizing that our current version, although robust and working well and we don't have a crisis, will get outdated. There are new technologies, there are new efficiencies, and we want to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, and we essentially have three big different groups working on it. We have groups of internal clerk's office folks working on the internal business processes. We have very vigorous groups of judges who think they got left out last time when the system was designed trying to document exactly what Chambers needs. And then we have a third group uh, that's called the additional stakeholders, which is everybody else who uses the federal courts. What do you want from our case management systems? And we plan to spend a good bit of the next 18 months eliciting from you uh, in every way we can think of, even Twitter, uh, to uh, get as much information as we can about how you use our systems now, what you see its deficiencies as being, and how we can improve it. I happen to chair that third group, so it's going to be a large part of my life uh, for the next uh, couple of years. Now, uh, we are right at time, but uh, I, I would like to give you an opportunity for a couple of questions. Uh, there's just so much material that we could cover. We've tried to be concise, and I hope you found it helpful. And, if you've got, anybody's got a question, I'll be glad to uh, try to take it. Uh, Mike Johnson from Minnesota. We use digital audio recording uh, through a vendor called CourtSmart. 
But the systems uh, are so sensitive, they will pick up every conversation in the courtroom. And there's concern there that conversations between counsel and client, even though uh, mumbled and muted so that you might not hear them from the bench or even from the back side of the courtroom, are being picked up uh, by the system. How sensitive is the system that you are using, and have you encountered any of the same problems? Well, we use all of this, all, all the systems. I think every proprietary system is used by some federal court, and part of the complication of this pilot was creating an interface that looked the same, that worked with all of these different systems. So some are more sensitive than others. That is a real concern. Uh, you have to train your lawyers to step away from council table or turn off the mic. I mean, the mic at council table has a switch. Uh, we tell them, if you want to have a private colloquy with your uh, client, turn the switch off uh, so that it doesn't get picked off, uh, the, uh, uh, picked up. The ultimate protection is uh, if we do pick up something that's totally inappropriate and the lawyer lets us know that that might have happened, we just don't load up that session. In my courtroom, we try to be as insensitive as possible. Um, <laughs> But you're the goosing court. <laughs> that's just, that's right. I know. <laughs> Anyone else? Up there. I'm sorry, where did you point? Uh, uh, I just saw a hand right I'll here. Hi, uh, Lisa Norris Lampy from Oregon. I had a question about the written opinions. Am I correct in understanding that certain orders of the court are not uploaded to PACER because a judge has determined that it doesn't qualify as a written opinion, or is it just that it's tagged as a written opinion and that enhances the search capability? Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll take that. Um, PACER is a view on the entire case, case file, so any order entered in a case unless it's sealed will be available on PACER. There's a way they can flag particular orders to be opinions. Uh, and we have a special written opinions report then that you can run and they show up on that special report. And that's, and that's a function of the E-Government Act, which requires court opinions to be available in searchable mode at no charge, no charge. Uh, by statute. So that designation triggers search from the website and free access to the public. Uh, Steve Schultz, uh, can you speak a little bit to how the courts are funding this next generation of CMECF and can you also speak a little bit <clears throat> to what the fees, what the PACER fees go to fund? I'll take that or at least I'll start it. Right. Um. <laughs> go ahead, You're the, it's, your, it's your project. Yeah. <laughs> We, will, we uh, charge the electronic public access fee to, and it all goes by statute right back into the program. One of the things that we, st we expanded the fee uh, from seven to eight cents a few years back in anticipation that we are, well, a couple of things, we needed to make our current infrastructure more robust. In we're replacing all of the servers in the courts right now. We're, we're completely replacing our network and so Essentially, it's, all, it's a working capital fund, so there was a lot of discussion that we had surplus, not so. Uh, we had caged some money off so that we could make these infrastructure improvements, replace our network so that people actually could use this functionally. And as you can see with the digital audio and especially with the written opinion, we do need that new network. We're working on that. Um, the other thing we've been caging money off for is to fund the next generation of CMECF, which is considered part of the electronic public access program proper. I'm going to make one more comment on fee revenue. Um, there is certainly a public perception out there that we are ungodly expensive. We don't believe so. In fact, another what we hope is a big announcement, what we're waiting for. Right now, if a user doesn't accrue $10 in usage charges in a year, all fees are waived, they're not billed. Um, that actually tabulates up to 50% of our users do, have not, did not pay a bill in 2009, did not pay a bill in 2008. So fully half of our users don't get a bill today. We went to the judicial conference, CACM did, and we're seeking authorization to make that annual waiver of $10 a quarterly waiver of $10. Uh, should the Judicial Conference approve that, they're meeting this month, we estimate that fully 75% of our user base will no longer pay a bill. And, and just with regard to fees, the one thing I think we should all keep in mind, and you can dice the numbers up a number of ways, but 
It's not that people are paying for the information. The information is free at the courthouse, as it's always been, and a good portion of it, based on this written opinion directive and based on the waivers um, that Michelle's just talked about, is free at your home, at your desktop. But what you're paying for is the delivery system uh, and maintaining the delivery system. It's not a price for the law. It's a price to have it handed to you on your desktop, at your convenience, at your command. Mm -hmm. And to conflate that pricing with a price for the information as opposed to a price for the delivery is gets you off on the wrong foot in thinking about these charges. But let me end with. Could I just make one question? You absolutely. Go ahead. Too, just from the standpoint of the trial court, um, these fees also go to funding uh, courtroom technology improvements, and I think the uh, I think the amount of investment in uh, courtroom technology uh, uh, in '09 was around 25 million dollars. That courtroom technology uh, has a number of important sort of public access components to it. For one, it makes available all this digital audio we talked about, and that then, in, in the case of the opinion I showed you, goes back into the written, uh, has the ability to go back in the written opinion. It also provides the technology that allows sophisticated uh, animations and expert witnesses to do their thing in, in very complicated trials. And we've got a problem out there, which is that juries, we're, we're selecting juries who don't have frequently the capability to understand a, a lot of very, very complicated technology, you know, whether it's computer technology or chemistry or molecular biology. And we've got to find ways to help juries understand this stuff. And courtroom technology does that because it allows uh, witnesses to prepare animations which are shown on flat screen monitors in the jury box. Every juror has their own flat screen monitors. And it also allows, we just went through a big upgrade in my court, courthouse, in my courtroom. And one of the things that we've done is uh, large flat screen monitors which will now, s and this is a very historic courtroom, so it has to be done in, in accommodating the, the historic nature of the, of the uh, courthouse and the courtroom. We have flat screen monitors now which will enable the people sitting in the gallery to see these, these animations and, and that are displayed. So they're not reaching, leaning over trying to watch it on the uh, council table monitor. As well as audio enhancements in these big courtrooms with 30, 40 foot ceilings where audio gets lost. We've spent a lot of money on audio so that people can hear what's going on. We've just put in new audio that I've never heard of this before but it actually embeds the speakers inside of the benches in the back of the courtroom and inside council table so that the, the, the wood benches actually perform as amplifiers. So now the, the back of the courtroom can really hear what's going on. This all ties, ties together and it's, and it's funded uh, uh, through these fees. So I, I just I want to make the point that this is an integrated system. It can't be looked at as just, just one thing. We are uh, approaching 10 minutes over and we're going to intrude on the uh, other panels and we can have to continue these in the, in the hallway, I think. They're interesting topics. Uh, uh, we're not perfect. I hope we've demonstrated to you that we are enthused and we are involved and we are trying to be thoughtful as we move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you.